Hi, this is Tim Fairfield of Keysight Technologies. In this video, I'm going to go over the setup of the LTSSM for debugging. I'm going to be looking at the contacts of PCI Express, talking about the tools that are required for using the BERT connected to a DUT, whether it's an add-in card or a system. We've got the Interact LTSSM link training and status state machine diagram here, and we'll be able to go through various states and alter the preset requests, look at the response times, things like that in the context of debugging. We do have compliance built in, and we also have some other tools available, but this focus is on getting this set up and making sure licensing is correct. We'll go to the four phases of equalization. So phase zero, the 2.5, 8 gig, 16 gig, up to 32 gig. And later on, we also now have available 64 gig, which is under development for PCI Express Gen 6. Now, before you get started, you need to verify that you do have the correct licenses installed. In the guide, it talks about the absolute minimum requirements to do link training, the option G32 and G4, the 32 gigabyte and de-emphasis. However, I would strongly recommend you consider um, the number of options down here, the A32, OA3, those are pretty much required to do any of the debugging as well. If you're doing Gen 6, there is a separate licensing for that as well. How do we find this? I've got the window here. You can go into utilities. And first of all, you can check your licenses. This is one way to do it to see what's installed. It's probably the easiest. So we have a number of these installed. If you want a list, this is another way to do it. You can go to IO, our connection expert, which is also known as IO Libs. We open that and we go to the instruments. Now we need to add an instrument or we need to check it. So let's go add a LAN instrument. Make sure we're entering the address, local host, host here, do a quick check. There we go. It will come back. It should come back with M8070. There we go. So we've got M8070, make sure this box is selected and we go to interactive IO. Now we can just do a sanity check here. So that's our, the BERT that we're using. And then if we do a star OPT options, that will show us the licenses that should be there and a question mark and do the same thing. And we get a list of all the installed options. Now this is fully loaded. It's a demo system, but you get the idea. License check done. You can manually go through that. If you need anything, you have to do that. So the other thing that you need is we need the blue sync cable connected. And if we look at the front of our module, I, I've got a real one here. It's a bit of a mess. That's what the sync cable looks like. So make sure that cable is installed. That's extremely important for the link training. Another thing that's really useful, um, especially for being remote, and I'm actually remote to my equipment. My equipment is a 45 minute drive away right now. And I am using the Syn Access Net Booter, the basic one that they have here is a two channel can do up to 15 amps, which is okay for the BERT, that will work. And what it does is it allows you to control the power outlet. You can either use a connect with a serial port and do it programmatically, or if you're doing it manually, in order to toggle the dot, the simplest thing is to reboot it. So I'm gonna show you that on the screen. This is what it looks like. And I have a monitor going on here. So we have a little light down here. I don't know if you can see it, but if I toggle that, We'll see that light go out. So right here, it just blinked it out and it will basically toggle that dot. The next thing I'm gonna show you, another important aspect. So our partner software provider, Bitify, has a tool called the Link Training Suite. I would say if you're getting into this for the first time, this is a handy tool to use. It basically allows you to configure the bird without any hassles, all the patterns are loaded, and then you can go into an interactive link training by editing parameters in the software. This is a really nice bundle that allows you to quickly change and test out scenarios. The next thing is the connection to the actual dot. So the physical connection, and these are generic diagrams. You may using, be using a system board or a test chip board in an ASIC mode, but on the left-hand side, we have the ref clock being provided. So the left is the system setup. So that means that we will be sending from our pattern generator down to the receiver of the device and then the loop back to the error detector on the BERT. Also, there is a clock that goes from the pattern generator to the error detector. That's help us to help us to do synchronization. 
And in a system board situation, the ref clock is provided from the device under test as well. And of course you need a power supply and that sort of thing. On an add-in type of system, what is different is that the bird also supplies the ref clock out of the trigger out connectors. And that will go to the ref clock and that is going to be used as the clock source. If you forget to, for instance, connect the ref clock or connect this reference here, you might be able to do link training and I've seen it happen. It almost seems like it shouldn't work, but it actually does. And, but you will never get a BER reading, BER reading at all. You'll just get a, a very high BER. So that is a, if you're having any issues, the very first thing to try is check these connection diagrams. It's very important to do that. I do want to talk about the actual physical setup that I used for this demo. If we look here, I'm using from the PCI SIG Express Gen 4 board. You could be using a Gen 5 or a Gen 3, depending on what you're doing. We have the physical dot here. This is a fiber channel card. We have these connectors. So these are MPX connectors and they convert to SMA and then you need to cable these and adapt those to go to the BERT. And on the other end, so we're connected on the RX side from the receiver side so we can send a signal in from the BERT. And the TX side that goes out of the DUT is here, connected back into the error detector input. The other thing that we have to connect is the ref clock and right here, let's just zoom in on that. So we need the ref clock that we can pull, provide in the case of an add-in card, that's where we will be putting that ref clock and that is connected into the BERT trigger out. And in addition, do not forget to set for external ref clock on the switch on the compliance board, that's important. Otherwise you will not be using this ref clock. That is the physical setup I'm using. I'm only doing add-in card. The other thing you can do is use the compliance baseboard and plug directly into a system. This is the compliance baseboard with all the breakouts for the different lanes and the clock out on this board. That's how you would achieve that. Here's another diagram of that. Again, this gives you a little better view before we've connected anything. But again, this is what, how you would be adapting and connecting and breaking out from a system board. Next. If you're loading up one of the presets, which I'll talk about soon, but let's go over to the BERT. Let's go try this out. You're going to make sure that you're choosing for the right instrument. So let's go into the BERT software. This one's already preloaded, but I'm going to change that. I'm going to go and do a preset. Let's preset the instrument. So let's go to here and we're going to get some things set up here now. So if you have the cabling and the licensing, you're probably good to go. And the next is how do we configure this thing? Okay, so I'm gonna basically close everything off here. All right, let's close this window so we know where to find it as well. So first of all, we basically are at five gigs, so I'm really reset. So I'm gonna application PCI Express, PCI, let me use Gen 4, because that's the kind of device I have. Now your choice is, if you choose out of the default directory, that's gonna be for an M8020. And if you try to load that, so let's load one up, endpoint rev 07 recall it's going to throw errors this is exactly what happens cannot due to a configuration mismatch okay so what is a configuration mismatch I mean it's looking for it's expecting m8041 but the configuration is using an m8054 so it means you need to make sure you're selecting the right equipment in the setup so it's a little bit not obvious so that's why i'm going over this is that down here we have the M8040 setup. So let's go grab that again. So let's go to the PCI4 RX LTSSM. Let's recall that. We can cancel these out, uh, these errors. We'll, we'll get rid of those later. It'll recall the instrument state. It's loaded some things up. It's loaded the right data transfer rates. It's got the output set. So what I like to do next is go into the modules, look at data out. What is the amplifier set for? amplitude 400 peak so that's be 800 peak to peak ac coupling and data in are we cdr yes we are if that isn't cdr you're never going to see anything and let's go back to the sequence editor so we're in the sequencer editor and we'll take a look at a few things here so first of all i want to clear these errors so we can just get rid of that all right so we've seen it's loaded up a pattern and it's got a few blocks loaded so what you'll notice in the sequence editor, 
We have a link training down and we have a different setup here coming up on the right. We have a lot of states, a lot of dark target presets, and these are all the settings that you have available to you during this debug. Essentially, if we click on idle at the top, we've got a block here, then we have the link training up, and then we have a test pattern. So what we're trying to do is get from this state all the way into test pattern four. So we can see where we're sitting and waiting by the number in front of this. So this will start off with the link training down and it'll go idle and it's going to wait. What is it waiting for? That's a good question because we need to look at the block. What is it waiting for? It's actually waiting for a break situation to move on to the next phase. The other thing is we need to make sure that our dot is reset from the top. So that's where our this toggle here is important. I'm going to do this remotely. So it's going to turn it first, second, and then turn it back on. That's recycling the dot so it's ready to go. And two important features when you're doing the uh, link training is we have this loop back and we have these if statements. And these if statements will move us from block to the next block. So if I select link training down, generator block, what happens? It's the block type is a link training type of block, direction down. And then there's block settings, block branches. If it detects this, it'll go to block idle. So it's going to move ahead to idle based on detecting a link training, for instance. If it goes into idle, let's go to block branches. If it gets a break, and that means if I hit the break signal, it's going to jump to the link training up. If you're in link training up and you look at the block branch, block, there's two of them. It goes either goes to test pattern, which is the uh, loopback pattern, or if it's an error of some sort, it'll go back to link training down and then trickle back into idle. So if all goes well, if I hit the break and everything's ready to go, we should get a, a be able to get a BER reading. The one thing here, I did not turn on the output, so nothing's going to happen. I need to go back to modules and uh, amplifier. Output state is on. Oh, we didn't turn on the global output. So there we go. I'll just move ahead to the sequence editor. Now I'm going to hit break. And as soon as I did that, we already trained to a BER of zero. Now, I'm not using any impairments at all during this demo. If you had ISI channels installed, you may get a lower BER. We can detect if we're getting errors by forcing insert error just to make sure things are working. So that gets us to this state. Now, it trained into loopback. So where is the setting? Oh, before I go there, this is the error detector side of things. Now that's gonna wait, and we're gonna go to the block branches as well. And if it sees the target state link training, it's going to jump into the test pattern and look for the test pattern. If that does see that, it's just gonna loop forever at this point. And if it does, it'll start measuring BER. It got to that state. And we also know we got to that state because the number in front here is this test pattern ED. And on the generator side, we got all the way down to state four. So we're in good shape right now. Now, where is the log report? The log report is shown in orange. We need to click that and bring it to the front. Normally when you open it, it comes to the side. Now you can look at this in different ways. I tend to pull it this way. Remember that you can place this wherever you want based on this kind of layout. You could plug it here. I could close that out and just reopen it again and it'll let's go. Oh, I must've killed it. So if you erase, that's gone forever. So. I'm going to go back. That's okay. Let's recycle the state. So we got there. We accidentally erased the link training log. I did that. And I'm going to go back now and fix things up. First of all, I've got to, I've got to recycle, restart things from the top. So I'm going to go to restart. When we do that, we see that this now, the PG is now in state two because it's kind of jumped ahead to idle already. And then I'm going to recycle the uh, dot. We have to toggle the dot. If we had the uh, reset button uh, available to us, we could just press that with our finger. Here, we just do it remotely that way. And as soon as I hit this, we should get something come up. And there we go. So we get a BER zero, and then we get a report in the link training log. So we get the information that we want. We get the timing on the different states that are here. We got L0, recovery equalization phase. There's also L0 uh, recovery equalization. And these are for the different speeds. So on the right, we see the speed. We see when things happen. We get a report there. 
we also get information on the equalization. We jumped ahead to Gen 3 and Gen 4 right away, and the preset P5 was accepted. We could go to dot .equalization and look at the presets, priest cursors, and main cursors that were used as well, so we get that report. Now, we can go in and change some of these. The idea here is maybe I want to start off, start preset Gen 3, not at P5. Let's pick P9. And if we change that, and we need to now load, download that to the BERT. And if everything's allowed, because some states are not allowed, so we're going to go from P9. The start preset Gen 3 should be P9. That's what we should see. So let's remember that. Let's clear this linked training log, or this will just depend on to the end. So... We can leave it like that. We need to go back and recycle again the, the dot. Okay, and we need to restart this. And we should see a break. We get a new one. Now we see Gen 3. You see this here? We get P9 as our starting preset. Okay, so that's our start equalization. Now you have other option here. So we can do bypass presets only mode. If we do bypass, it will should jump all the way, if I'm correct, <laughs> all the way to, <laughs> to Gen 4, if the DUT supports it. Let's give it a try. Let's go. Let's recycle that. Let's go back to the top to recycle. We're at stage two. Let's see what happens. What we see happen here, we stop at phase one and move along. So we only really go to phase one in here. If you take a look there. If we look at the previous step, we were going through phase one, phase two, and phase three. So that's the difference uh, in bypass mode. We're actually bypassing the other phases. You can also define a number of other parameters in here. The point of this is to show you what is available to you. Another thing that's really useful is being able to trigger at a particular state, a trigger state. So if we choose a particular trigger state, recovery equalization phase, you can, whenever you hit one of these states, you can fire out a trigger to the scope. Now think about the situation of how you need to be physically connected. If you wanna monitor on the scope and look for issues or look at these changes, what you need to do is the following. You need splitters at the TX side, you need splitters at the receiver side, and have two differential pairs going to the scope. So that way you can monitor TX and RX at the same time. And you also need a trigger signal as well, which can be toggled out of the BERT. When you do that, so let's look at what that would be. If we go to the block add control, we have control out, sys out, or sys out B. You can choose any one of those to send the trigger signal out to go to the scope. When you get that trigger, you send it to the scope, it'll capture both sides exactly the position that you've chosen up here, whether which trigger state it you wanted to trigger on to look at some issue that may be coming up. And the key site scopes all have the availability to have protocol decode. So in that case, I would recommend you have the license for protocol decode. You can then correlate this directly on the scope. So it's like cross-triggering the scope using that method. The scope does have a way to trigger on protocol. The problem with that is, is if you're only looking for a one-shot state, there the scope is capturing and processing and looking for the signal. And in that case, highly likely that you'll miss the trigger. In this way, it's gonna wait for an edge trigger, which a scope normally does. And when you provide that trigger to it, it's actually going to trigger on that. And you will be able to see a uh, correlation between what's happening here and what you selected with what's on the scope. And then you can do more debugging. Settings you could set in here, link localization, start preset, what other common clock architecture, depending on the clock architecture. At the top, you choose the speed that you can have. So you see we have three, four, five, and six. We also do this, this same type of system is used for USB. So again, this is useful uh, to understand if you're doing USB as well. And depending if the dot is a host or an add-in card, different things will be highlighted. So you see here, there are some settings that are not available as a host, as a system board that you cannot adjust. So it does that. And these squares here set it back to the default. Let's see what else. So let's go to the Bitify tools. So with Bitify, first of all, I am going to set this, just go to 
let's go right back to preset here. So let me do this. I'm going to show you what the Bitify tool does. So let's go to Valaframe link training suite. Here we go. We don't want Valaframe. Valaframe does other tests. So I'm going to launch that. We'll take a look. There we go. Okay. So the link training suite. So the first thing I'm going to do is connect. I've got the loopback instrument already. I picked the instrument type. So it's M8020. I'm only doing one channel. If you are controlling the power switch, the Synaxis power switch, if it's connected, so we can get the connection info if we want, it'll show you physically how to connect this in the way, and then we want to initialize instruments. So let's initialize the instrument. We'll see in the background some activity happening. So right now, PCI Express N5991 link training suite is initializing the instruments, loading patterns, for what we see on the screen here. I will probably be changing this, but we can go and explore a little bit of what has been set. This takes a lot of the guesswork and does a lot of the automation for you for a number of test scenarios when you're doing a dot debug. So let's look at, let's wait for this to complete. Okay, so this was set for a Gen 5 scenario, uh, root complex ASIC uh, 32G, uh, I'm not sure what it loaded into the pattern. So let's go take a look at what's loaded into the sequence. I don't know if it completed that yet. So generally, if it's fixed training, we want it interactive. So if I apply that, I think that's where we're going to see some patterns get loaded. And I, sh oh, I should have changed the dot type. So I'll change that next. Okay. So we see that it has loaded the correct training patterns. Uh, it's making the adjustments to whatever was sent to your P4. And you have the options in here to change some things. So I'm going to change it to an add-in card. Okay. And I want a data rate of, I want a lower data rate because this is a, it's a Gen 4 device. It's actually not Gen 5 compatible. So it's really uh, probably truly Gen 4 so let's go back. Let's pick 16 gig. Okay, it's going to apply them live. I'm just finishing up, loading the timing. Now you can start a BER measurement here, but we haven't trained through yet. So we got to go back to the sequence editor. Let's go and reset the device. Let's toggle. All righty. And then we get a BER of zero. Then again, after the set, reset BER measurement. There we go. You can change the compliance patterns here, which is really nice uh, automatically. You've got all the jitter and impairments that you can add. You can turn on jitter if you want. In this uh, demo, I'm gonna start from scratch and I've got a dot connected as we've shown. It's an add-in card. Let's load up uh, PCI Express Gen 5 M8040, but we'll do the 16 gig. I'm gonna rec recall that the instrument state that will set the clock speed and the correct LTSSM settings. And again, I'm only doing this. I'm not using an ISI board or impairment, but the idea is that we can need to turn on the global outputs first, make sure that's on. So remember to do that. Otherwise, the out if the output's half there, let's restart the dot. Let's do a reboot or a recycle. So that'll get the dot ready to go. I like to always send this up to the top to restart. We're already in uh, idle state in state two. Let's toggle that. Now, as soon as we do that, we get the log. Let's open up the log on the side and let's improve the view on this. Let's move it over some more. So we see that we've uh, got a, a link training report. Here we've got the different speed changes and the also the BERT TX equalization, the BERT's acting as the root complex in this case. And then we have the dot equalization uh, down below. Now, let's go and see what happens if we try to run with the five protocol at, to Gen 5 speed and see what happens. So we have to do this on both sides. So if we click on this, we have to make sure we set both of these to Gen 5, this side and this side. And let's download that. Now, let's close this report from the old one it's just to clear things up. And let's recycle. And we see now we're in a state where we're in the detect active and pulling quiet. And it gives us an kind of a, a message here that's saying precode status dot did not request precoding at Gen 5 speed. So that tells us that it wasn't able to do it at Gen 5 speed. 
and do a handshake there. So the next thing you might want to do is trigger out and look at it to see what exactly happened. If you wanted to dig down that deep, there may be other issues there, but this definitely gets a report. We can always go back. So if we go back to the Gen 4 rate and change it on the other side as well, then we download that. Now, we're still in state two. We could probably just toggle through here now. There we go. So yeah, we probably want to restart because there were some issues here. It went back to detect quiet. So it looks like uh, it made an attempt here, but let's fully recycle the instrument. So it must have got into an odd state. Let's go back to the top, restart and fire it off again. And now we get the full link training as we would have expected it. Okay, and I'm going to look at the reports that I've got for three different devices. If you look at device one, device two, and device three, we'll see some differences here. Essentially, the detect active polling, so this execution time is going to be different for each one of these. The other thing is the accept, which presets are accepted during the equalization phase. So for this particular device, there's only a few of these presets that's accepted where in this particular device, it pretty much accepts any of the presets or most of them. And this one only accepts two. This is something you may want to investigate further. Maybe this is expected behavior, but this is the kind of report that you can get. And in the final case of the DUT TX equalization, it doesn't even report. So there may be some issue there, although that is a fully compliant card. So it should be okay, but again, this is a comparison of each of the devices. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is how to trigger a scope from a state within the LTSSM. This can be useful if you're trying to look at what's going on the analog side of things. If there are errors coming up, you can look at the signal integrity on the scope. We need to set up the sequence control correctly we also need to set up the triggering on the scope and your scope should have a protocol decode function as well. And we need to send a trigger, a physical trigger out on a line to one of the channels or to the aux trigger channel on the scope. And that allows us to look at one or both sides of the TX and the RX to look at what may be going on in a particular point in the sequence. So when you start up, if you're familiar with the sequencer and the features, there's such a, something called the sequence control. If we add that, we can have a target control out A, send out a signal based on a trigger event. So first of all, I wanna trigger on the event that I've selected with the trigger state L0. I can pick any of these. I'm gonna start with L0. So that is gonna be the event that will cause the scope to trigger. The next thing I've got to do is I need to add a control block and I've had this here. So if this isn't here right now, you can add a control block. Our target, we need to send the signal out on control out A. You have control out A or control out B as an option. We wanna have this come out from module one. The source of this trigger is not break. Break is up here. You could do that if you wanted to. However, what you want is the link training trigger that came from above. So when that, is satisfied, we will trigger. And the source location has to be set as well. Once you've changed these, you've got to download them so it's put into the sequencer itself onto the, the BERT. Now, the other thing is in modules view, nothing's going to happen unless you set control out A to an output state. And here you can condition the signal, what amplitude, what offset, high, low. You may need, want to trigger something else with this. You may need to adjust these levels for aux triggering and so forth. So we've got this all in place. And then the next thing we need to do is try firing this out. So first of all, let's make sure this is all working. I'm gonna choose sequence editor. And then I'm just gonna do a quick test. I'm gonna restart this and, okay. So we've got this state here. Looks like I'm gonna to have to go in and reset my dot. So let's do that. I'm gonna recycle the dot. So let's do that. And when we go to the top and reset this, now we get the full uh, kind of report that we're expecting. So sometimes your dot will get hung up. So just keep aware of that. Now, the next thing is I've got the scope. I'm gonna show you a little bit about the scope. We've got triggering setup. So the trigger setup is I've got channel one and I've got edge trigger. I'm not using protocol trigger. I'm using edge trigger because I want the edge to come from the BERT. I also have, I only have one ch channel connected up because I only had so much 
only had so much splitters available to me, but you could probe those with probes or you could use splitters, a power dividers, enough to get the signal through. On the front channel, it's gonna be easy. On the back channel, you're gonna have more ISI and more loss. You may have to do some signal conditioning afterwards. But for the purpose of this, I'm gonna show you how this all works. So I'm using a V-series scope. And so the protocol decode happens to be in this portion of the menu. If you're using a UXR, you'll see it under analyze. It'll be somewhere down here, but the setup here, let's go back here, protocol decode. I've got it up for gen one. I've set the data source for channel two and we've got everything set up, ready to go. So next I'm going to go and rearm this farthest from the top. I've got my in, I've got a manual trigger. I'm going to do a single trigger. I'm going to do single. We're going to go back and recycle this. And there we go. So now we have a capture and I've got the protocol decoder set up. We're actually able to see uh, data states and so forth. And we can, we can look within that if we need to, if we need to come out and we can look uh, for events within there. So we have an end of data stream, start of data stream, that sort of thing. Let's go back to the top, single trigger, ready to go. So let's go break, there we go. So here we have information. So this white line at the bottom shows that we've got packets. So we can drag this line and we can now zoom in and look at the analog activity that's going on in here. If we had both sides of the scope probed for the TX and the RX, we can make a correlation. Did the device respond with a particular de-emphasis value, something like that? So this just gives you some insight of what you can do. The other thing is you can get disoriented with your trigger point. So now we've zoomed in. This is one thing I like to recommend. The trigger point is no longer here. We've zoomed over to the left. The trigger point is right here. And we're using a window. If we look at the very top here, that's the window we're presently looking at. If you get mixed up in here, I can bring back the trigger point. And the best way to do this is using the horizontal and set that to zero. And now we've got our trigger point back and we can go out. If we wanted to zoom out, we can use the scroll wheel over this and look for packets, some activity there. There's a little bit of activity over here. So I want to see what that's all about. Let's get this over here. Let's pull that in and then we can, we can zoom in on that if you want, or even better, we can just do this and draw a box. We should be able to draw a box if we're good. Right where, right around that point. Wave horizontal waveform zoom. There we go. So now we can then move the cursor over and see what packets we have here. So that gives you an idea how do we can navigate. Again, if we want to get back to the trigger, we go back to horizontal. We can go back to zero offset and zoom in and out as we wish. Let's move over here. What happened afterwards? TS1, Gen 3, 4, and so forth. EQ, TS2. You may want to just grab a section here around the point horizontal waveform zoom and then start zooming in right on the data here and we can look at the raw data what's going on here in the details and pull this up take a look so that in a nutshell is how to cross trigger to the scope and be able to look at the analog aspects along with the BERT using the BERT to trigger the scope. So we've gone through a lot of the basic setup, touched on some of the parameters. If you want to dig in deeper and know more of the features that you have available to you, I would strongly recommend going to the online help within the BERT software itself. So if we go to help, scroll down to the PCI Express section, you've got tons of resources here. The complete list of settings that you can go through gives more details as well. There's so many features in here that it's hard to cover in one video, but this should get you started. And that allows you to experiment. This is a good place to make a reference. Otherwise, you can also work with Keysight directly to uh, get more information on how to do something specific that you're looking for. One thing which is also very important is the presets or being able to change the preset matrix. So let's go in to take a quick view of this. If we get to modules view, we go to data out and we open up the de-emphasis box here. We can actually go in and change the presets that are used. Let's open one up. Let's see. You can open one up and take a look at what it would look like. These are some that are pre-calibrated, but if we want to edit this, 
Let's load the preset. So we can go in and edit this information and change what the pre, main, and post cursors for various settings on various presets. So I just wanted you to be aware of that, that this is a feature that you can use. If we go into the help, there is more information about that into the interactive link training, opening the matrix, how to uh, manipulate this table and create your own table for your own debug situations. So to summarize, we covered licensing, getting things started, how to connect cabling, tools like the Synaxis remote switch that can be a useful tool. We talked about the Bitify tools, the physical DUT connection and the setup, how to go through the sequence editor, getting familiar with that, the log report, important there, changing presets and getting some effects based on that, how to set up a trigger over to a scope, the LTSSM tool from Bitify, a walkthrough of a Gen 4 device and how that is uh, done. And finally, a bit of the transmitter presets that you can modify and use in your debug setup. So as always, thank you for watching my video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. That helps me keep things going and get some exposure out there on YouTube. Thank you very much. Good day.